I wanted to make this video because my dad just got over stage four cancer and I know a lot of people out there can benefit from hearing this story because the first thing you do when you get a diagnosis like that is you mentally lose it. And we've been through a lot the last few years and I wanted to put this out there because I know others come to YouTube right away trying to get information and I think giving people hope is the most important thing when you're dealing with a horrible illness like this. Um, so this isn't a Hollywood production, but it's full of great information and if you stick around, uh, I think you'll go into whatever you're about to deal with with a better outlook than you currently have when it's over. So thank you for listening and I hope you learned something from it. So long story, back in 2015, my dad was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis is this awful disease where your lungs begin to harden. And he wasn't a smoker. Uh, they actually call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, because they don't know what causes it. That's just the truth of the matter. Uh, in my opinion, I think he got it from being around gas stations his whole life. Uh, when he came to the U.S., he was 19, 20 years old, and he's worked in the gas station business uh, for the last 50-plus years. Uh, his office was in the back of one, and I personally think that is what caused it, but the doctors could never pinpoint it. So when we first got that IPF diagnosis, the first thing I did was run to the internet to get information. I've never heard of this thing. And the first thing you'll see with pulmonary fibrosis is about 90% of people die within two years. It's a horrible, horrible disease. And so right away, I'm floored. I'm just like, what on earth is this thing and so within like six months his condition completely deteriorated he was on an oxygen machine he he got this like oxygen machine that he'd like wear in a sack and uh he took it everywhere and it was crazy to me because he was always such a healthy guy never any problems and that's what we were dealing with and along the way they got him into a couple medications that really changed the game for him. Um, I think they were new at the time. One was Esbriet, uh, the other was Ofev. And these medications really prolonged his life longer than I was expecting. It was, uh, it was a crazy time for us, but he ended up making it four years to 2019 where they put him on a lung transplant list here at Methodist in Houston and within one day he got a lung transplant. So going into that lung transplant timeline, uh, my mother and I took these classes at Methodist where they prepare you for what's coming. Um, many people don't get a lung transplant in time, right? You know, it's hard to find a match. Uh, he was 69 years old at the time. I had read online that they don't like to do transplants on people over 70, so we were really up against the clock. Um, when they put him on the transplant list, it was like three months before his 70th birthday. And it was nothing like I expected. He, he got on the list the next day, they got him a lung, they called us at home and they said, hey, you need to come in. This was around like 11 a.m. that day. We, we live pretty close to Methodist, so we took him down. And we were there all day. Uh, the actual procedure didn't begin till maybe eight o'clock at night, eight, nine o'clock or something like that. Um, it was a really powerful moment. You know, you're sitting there in the Walter Tower and nobody's there at eight o'clock at night. It's pretty empty. And you see uh, when they rush in with that cooler, which obviously holds the new lung, uh, for him, they did a one, a single lung transplant. He, he was too old. They couldn't do a double lung. And so we were there all night, four in the morning, and it was over. He had a new lung, and he stayed at the hospital for about 45 days until uh, 
he was able to go home. So that was the first time he overcame an improbable illness. Um, like I said, I had read online pulmonary fibrosis, most don't survive. He did. He, he survived not only two years, he survived four, four and a half years, did a lung transplant, and he was completely normal. Now, this is where the fun begins. After the lung transplant, actually before the lung transplant, they had told us, you know, when, when you do a lung transplant, you know, we're going to put you on immune suppression drugs and you're going to be at a higher probability of things like cancer. And at the time, he didn't think much of it. He said, well, you know, I can't breathe right now. So if I can breathe, then I'll deal with whatever comes next. And it's been five years since he did his lung transplant. Well, right now in May. In May, it'll be five years. And, you know, most people don't survive this long on a lung transplant. You look at the statistics, a lot of people don't even make it a year. Uh, your body rejects the organ, things go wrong, you, you don't make it. He is now about to start his fifth year. And along the way, he's had cancer five times since then. And what causes the cancer is typically your immune suppression drugs mean you have no immune system, right? Your body, they don't want it to reject the organ. So you're taking these immune suppression, I mean, he takes like 40, 50 pills a day. I mean, it's, it's insane how many pills he takes. But the immune suppression drugs uh, really weaken you. And they... They serve a purpose, though, because if your body rejects that new organ, you're, you're dead. So the first four bouts of cancer that he had were skin cancer. They were all on his head, on his arm. Um, you know, as a lung transplant recipient, you go weekly to the lung transplant center. Here it's at Methodist in Houston, and they're on top of you. You know, there's blood work. They're, they're constantly checking you. They're poking and prodding because, I mean, you're their guinea pig now right for their data so they are really really on top of you and every time he got cancer right away they took care of it it was always you know small things on his scalp nothing uh, nothing serious and then in around March of 2024 he got this big lump on his nose and you know any of you that deal with uh, a sick person like this you know that they don't like going to the doctor. And so we had hit a point after a few years where he was now going to the lung transplant center every four to five weeks instead of weekly. Uh, you know, early on it's weekly. Later on it just becomes like a once a month thing. And my mother and I kept telling him, hey man, you need to go get this thing checked out. It just doesn't look right. And he's like, ah, well, you know, it's not a big deal. And so he never went in to get this thing checked. It kept growing bigger and bigger on his nose. And he finally got it checked. And it turned out to be something called Merkel cell carcinoma. And here's the website, MerkelCell.org. And Merkel cell carcinoma, again, another thing I had never heard about, right? You always hear about all these skin cancers, melanoma, all these different ones. I've never heard of this thing. And so they told us that day when we were at MD Anderson, which, uh, by the way, the, the people at MD Anderson are amazing. They are truly the best, the nicest people, and we're very lucky to live in Houston just a couple minutes away from them. But the day we got the Merkel cell diagnosis, they basically told us, look, this is a really, really rare form of cancer. I mean, maybe not even a thousand people a year get this thing. And most of them are like your father and they have, you know, immune suppression issues and uh, it's, it's a tough disease, but we're going to do all that we can to get through it. So what do I do? I go home, I start reading on the internet and I find this website and it doesn't look good. Um, you know, you pull up some data and right away what you'll notice is... Not many people make it to year two, right? Barely 30% of people make it to year two. And I'm I'm floored again. I'm just like, my God, are we ever going to get through these illnesses? And 
So I begin to stress out. Great. Now we've got this improbable thing to deal with. Uh, actually, let me take it back. Let me, let me take it back. When he first got the Merkel cell diagnosis, it was simply on his nose. Okay, so we went through radiation. At the time, radiation was doable because it was simply on his nose. And so May, June, July, uh, it was on his nose. We got it taken care of. Radiation was a process. It was like every single day for a couple weeks. And uh, you'd have to go in there for a few hours. It was uh, Radiation was tough. You know, they fit you for that custom mask and it was on the tip of his nose and the lasers going in. And they told us it was over. In August, they said, well, the cancer's clear, it's over. And we were relieved. I mean, that was an exciting time for us. And then about a month and a half later, he goes back in in October, and they're like, we have bad news. It's spread everywhere, and now it's stage four. And we're kind of just sitting there looking at each other like, what, what the hell just happened? You guys just told us we were done with cancer. And they said, well, you know, cancer does come back at times and this can happen. And this time it was stage four. And that's when I came and I found this data on stage four. And I said, oh my God, you know, not a lot of people survive this. And so the thing with him that made it even trickier was being immune suppressed for his lung transplant. He couldn't take the approved immunotherapies, okay? Because it was stage four, they couldn't do radiation again. And they had to give us chemo. And from what the doctor told us at the time, chemo wasn't the preferred method of treatment, but it was the only option that we had. Uh, it was in too many places to do the radiation and pinpoint it. Uh, at this point, it had spread to his pelvis. It was in his blood, and it was on like the side of his face. And so... We all began to worry again, and they said, look, you're in the best hands. We're going to do everything we can to take care of it. And he had this great doctor. Her name was Dr. Ferrarato. Um, she was a young lady, but she really, a brilliant, brilliant person. Uh, un unbelievable what she did. And she was like the head of the head and neck uh, cancer at MD Anderson. Anyhow. Chemo treatment today is so much different from chemo treatment 30 years ago. 30 years ago, my aunt had uh, breast cancer. And I was a younger teen at the time. And all I remember was how violently ill she was. Um, vomiting. Her, her son would have to carry her up the stairs to the bedroom. It was, it was really horrible uh, in the 90s dealing with chemo. So mentally, that was the only thing I had ever experienced regarding chemo. I didn't really know what to expect when they said, you're going to begin chemo. So in my head, I just said, okay, well, dad's 74. This is probably going to be pretty rough. Let's, uh, let's just hope and pray. And we began chemo. And first round was three days. And, and we, did, we ended up doing six rounds of chemo. Uh, we did three rounds, and then around Christmas, we, we met with the doctor, and she's like, well, you know, I'm seeing some improvement, but we need to do three more rounds. And we said, okay, you know, you're, you're the expert. So it was six rounds total. I don't know how many rounds most people do, but uh, I don't think it's six. And so he did his first round, and he was completely fine. He came home the first day, the second day, third day. He was fine. And they do chemo on the weekends uh, here. It's like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't know if that's the case everywhere. But it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And that first week, he was completely fine. He got up Monday. He went to work. And he didn't miss a beat. You know, for him, work is... Uh, it keeps his mind off things. He likes to get up, get out of the house. And I'm, I'm happy he was able to do it. And then a couple weeks later, we did the second round nothing happened third round nothing happened I noticed his hair started to get white uh, he never had white hair before but it, it finally started to turn white but his hair wasn't falling out um, a little fell out but nothing uh, noticeable but it did turn his hair white fourth round fifth round then sixth round and 
when you finish the sixth round, they basically tell you you got to wait a month to do the scans. And that's a period where you're just in a lot of anxiety. You know, you're, you don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, you know, the whole process with cancer, you, you don't really talk to the doctor much. You know, you, you go to MD Anderson, you see the doctor basically, I think we saw the doctor like four or five times. Most of the time you're there with the tech doing the chemo. Um, you, you just don't get a lot of information, which that part kind of stresses you out. But now that it's over for us, I'm not stressed anymore but I could see where the anxiety comes for everyone so um, after he finished that sixth round we had a night like four weeks ago where I'm over there visiting him at his house and he he looks at me and my mom and he says I think I'm dying and he looked really like pale he looked uh, by round six it, it had kicked his butt you know, he was, he was really, really tired. Uh, he had lost some weight, but he, he looked at us that night and he, he, he always, he was always so optimistic the whole time. He was like, I'm going to beat this thing. I'm going to spend time with my grandkids. Like, you know, I've been through a lot in life, but you know, this is just one more thing. Like four weeks ago when he said that to us, I was just kind of shocked because he was kind of just giving up. And I don't know if it was just, you know, a decade of pulmonary fibrosis and cancer after cancer and whatnot, but he just didn't seem to have the will to live. And, you know, the thing is when you're battling something like stage four cancer, you, the mental aspect of it is one of the biggest things. You can't give up. You, 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 meant, you just have to fight and fight and fight. And I'm a big believer that you know, your body's energy has a lot to do with uh, overcoming something like this. And so it kind of crushed my soul that day to see him just broken like that. But, you know, I just believed that we had done everything we could with the chemo and things were going to work. And so yesterday we went in and we went in like 1.30 in the afternoon and they did, you know, the PET scan and we went in to talk to the doctor, and she's like, well, you know, the radiologist hasn't signed off on this, but it appears you're clear of cancer. And I said, what do you mean we're clear of cancer? I, I mean, I had read all this stuff online about how, you know, stage four, you're basically toast. And she's like, well, you know, some people do survive these things. And uh, she's like, your dad's been through a lot, and he seems to always get through it. So uh, we were all ecstatic, and I, I asked her, I said, okay, well, you know, last time, in a month and a half, it had come back and had spread everywhere. Why, uh, why do you not want to see us for three months? Because that's what she told us now. We, wanna, we don't want to see you for three months. And she said, well, you know, the chemo continues to work in your body and we just, we don't think we need to see you any sooner. And so for me, you know, when, when you have something like stage four cancer, every day is a gift, right? Just uh, next week is a gift, right? You never know what's going to happen with this stuff. So not having to do anything for the next 90 days is such a relief. I mean, we've been through... Literally, it's been a decade of every week you're either at the lung transplant center, you're at MD Anderson dealing with one of these cancers. And right now, for the first time in years, basically all he's got to do is go to the lung transplant center once a month. And so it's so nice. You know, she told us, go book a trip, get out of here, go do something. You know, you haven't gotten to leave town in so long dealing with these things and uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm happy for him, you know? I have learned so much over the last, you know, basically decade uh, going through all these illnesses, but the one thing I learned is not to read anything online, okay? You're here because you're looking for information online and I'm giving you a true story about my experience with what I read online. Pulmonary fibrosis. I said you're not going to beat it. We beat it. 
stage four Merkel cell carcinoma. Odds are you're not going to beat it. Jimmy Buffett, you know, in the middle of all this, Jimmy Buffett died a few months ago of Merkel cell carcinoma. And when that happened, I said, oh my God, we are so screwed because surely Jimmy Buffett had every resource in the world and he didn't survive it. And so that was a point where I was kind of crushed mentally some more where I just uh, didn't really know what to think. But we survived. And so the main thing to remember is every case is case by case. No two are the same. Um, you know, data is data, right? I'm a trader. I'm in the market. Data does tell the truth. But with cancer... Data is on a case-by-case -case basis. It's completely different. And just because one person dealt with this doesn't mean your situation is going to be like that. And just because my dad survived this doesn't mean you necessarily will. But I want you to have hope. Because without hope, you won't get through this stuff. You know, if you start thinking you're not going to make it, then you're going to have a tough time with this stuff. You have to think you're going to make it. And... You have to think that you're going to be that outlier that survives these things. And, you know, we fortunately were. And look, cancer is never over. Even though we're clear now, I, uh, <laughs> my screen went bright. Even though um, we're clear now, you're never over with cancer. And so, uh, I hope we don't have to deal with it ever again, but like I said, we've dealt with it five times in the last five years. Granted, every other time it was stage one, um, but the hope is we're done with this stuff forever. I'm, I'm tired of the word cancer. It's, it's a horrible, horrible disease, and uh, no human should have it five times in their life, but you know, it's part of getting a lung transplant, and if you ask him, he wouldn't trade the lung transplant for anything in the world, I mean, he could barely walk before the lung transplant. He had the oxygen machine. He could barely move a few steps. He was, he, you know, the lung transplant gave him five great years right now. It's It's been uh, a great time for all of us. He's gotten to play with his grandkids. And, you know, life is short. You just got to enjoy it while you can because these illnesses come out of nowhere and you never know how they're going to go or when you're going to go back to normal. So um, keep hope alive and you'll get through it. So thanks for watching this and I will catch you all later.